Hi, this is Jimmy Moyle with Head First Baseball. I wanted to thank everyone for tuning into this video. This is the Head First College Advising Seminar um, designed for upper division players. Typically, we like to do um, one of these at this time of year, kind of in the mid to late spring when high school is wrapping up and a lot of players are getting ready to solidify their college decisions and other players are kind of getting ready for that entering the recruiting process, um, you know, as they get into the summer. And we wanted to just kind of open it up to share a little bit of thoughts and insight about the process and also answer questions. So definitely thank you to everybody who wrote in and answered questions or who asked questions. And we're definitely gonna talk a little bit about some of those topics and, and try to answer some of your questions as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jimmy Moyle. I, I've been with Head First off and on for a number of years and um, joined the, the organization in a full-time role last summer. And one of my, one of my roles is um, kind of assisting with our college showcases and camps and just kind of um, you know, being a resource for people regarding college advising and just navigating the recruiting process. Uh, before coming on a Head First in a full-time role, I was a college coach for the better part of 12 years um, at seven different colleges. Um, I was actually a student assistant coach at UC San Diego um, my, my freshman year of college before playing at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. After that, I was on the coaching staffs at Menlo College, USF, UC Davis, San Jose State, Academy of Art University, and Lewis and Clark College in Portland. Uh, so definitely, I've, I've had a, a wide variety of experiences throughout the years at, at different colleges in Division I, II, III, and NAIA, um, as well as different levels of, you know, in-state, out-of-state, public and private, and, you know, different kind of levels of academic selectivity, too. So definitely, like I said, want to be a resource for all of you and, and you know, doing some of these seminars and answering your questions. Uh, in addition to, um, you know, if anyone is interested in, in meeting privately or in a small group to talk about your specific goals and kind of formulate a plan to get there as well. A um, couple of things we want to talk a little bit about and get, get to some of your questions right off the bat. Uh, a lot of very good questions on this one and, and definitely try to answer as many of them as we can. Uh, the first one was talking about the differences between levels. And I think that's a, a really good place to start. In, in our experience, a lot of players, they know they want to go to college. They know they want to play baseball, but it can feel very big. I think there's over um, 1,200 four-year colleges that have baseball teams. There's more than that at the community college level if you look at the whole country. And, and so it can feel like a very big, challenging question in front of you. And so I think, you know, just understanding some basics about the different levels is important and then getting a little bit more into your criteria that people use to select colleges and, and learn a little bit more about it as they go. Um, in a nutshell, uh, at the Division I level, the, the rosters are limited to 35 players. Of those, up to 27 can be on some form of scholarship and they have 11.7 total scholarships to divide between all the players. Uh, Division two, they're allowed nine scholarships and there's no roster limit, no scholarship minimum. NAI is allowed 12 scholarships. Uh, Division three is allowed no scholarships and California community colleges also don't give out scholarships. Um, Division three, two and NAI and community college also don't have roster limits. So they could keep in theory as many players as they wanted to. Division one is the only one with a roster limit. Uh, we made another video where we get into this a little bit more, but due to COVID-19, they're actually changing some of the rules for next year, which will probably just be a one-time thing, but we'll kind of see where that goes. That is a, a somewhat fluid situation at this point. But those are the, kind of the main rules uh, regarding scholarships and roster spots that each of the levels have to respect a little bit. Um, got the question too as well as, as to what does a scholarship actually cover and does anyone ever get a full ride? We'll talk a little bit more about some of the financial aid piece later on in the video, um, but just to kind of sum it up, what is it considered a full scholarship is tuition, room and board, and books. So the, the total cost of all that is considered one scholarship. Now, at the for baseball, um, you, you very rarely see people get, you know, huge scholarships. A, a very good scholarship is probably 50%, um, if not more than that then you know, most people are gonna kind of be in the 25 to 50% range is, is typically what I've seen in my experience. Um, very few players, and I say very few, I've never actually, I couldn't actually tell you one who's ever gotten it. I'm sure somebody has somewhere, but really no one gets a full ride. Um, what schools can do, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the video when we get to some financial aid part, 
is they can combine different kinds of scholarships. So a baseball scholarship is one avenue toward getting a scholarship. There's also different forms of academic money and need-based financial aid as well that players can qualify for. So between all the different ways that, that um, schools can manage that, there are players who can get more money and get closer to 100%, but it is very rare and you're, you're probably never gonna see it come all the way from baseball. Um, so yeah, just, you know, it's kind of a little bit about scholarships and how that process works. Um, one of the things too that kind of, uh, another question we got was, how do I find out the right level for my skills? And I think this is a good one and kind of touching on a little bit what we talked about earlier. Most players are trying to kind of find out where they fit. And I think with that, there's a lot of ways that you can, you can approach that. Um, one, and one of the nice things about being at a place like Head First and about being in Northern California is you're going to play with and against a lot of players who go on to the college level. And so, you know, really look at who from your specific programs and teams and people you know have gone on and, and kind of where do you stack up with that. And that does take a little bit of honest self-reflection to be able to admit that, hey, I'm probably not the greatest player ever. I think I'm pretty good where does that put me and who am I kind of like and where did they go and find success in college? And through our program, we've looked at it and we've had players at all kinds of different levels at dozens of different schools. So there are a lot of different ways you can approach that. Um, I also would strongly encourage you to look at different colleges and try to go watch them practice and play. A little bit difficult right now, but hopefully if we're back up and running by next fall, that's something that, that we could do. Um, or that you could do as a player is go watch a team inner squad and try to get a sense of the talent level that's on that team. And again, there's a little bit of honest self-reflection that goes into that to be able to admit that you're not as good as some of the players there or you know, be able to tell that you are better or whatever. But that's a good place to start is to really see the competition that you'd be going up against in that program. Um, and then I think having some conversations with your your coaches and the people in your life that either coach you on teams or do lessons or can kind of be a resource to help you identify some schools that could be a good fit. So really using using that approach as well. And then paying attention to the schools that, that do recruit you or do have contact or, or don't have contact with you um, that you wind up getting seen by as we go through the summer and, and fall um, when most of you will you know hopefully get some sort of exposure to college coaches throughout that process. Um, and for some players that might be this upcoming summer fall, for some it might be a year after that, whenever it winds up being. Um, so how do I know what they are looking for academic, academically and athletically is another good question. And, you know, for that, I think asking colleges directly. One thing that we'll talk a little bit more about is making contact with college coaches, uh, writing emails and kind of how that goes along. And I think it's a very fair question to ask them what they're looking for, whether it's certain position groups in a certain recruiting class, um, or kind of along the line, if there's certain metrics that they look for in terms of velocities or foot speed, if they are looking for left-handed hitters or whatever it might be, but you can certainly ask that in the, in the question. Uh, most colleges are fairly open about kind of their median SAT and GPA scores that they tend to admit. So looking for a school that's a good fit academically uh, from those places is a good way to kind of start and narrow down your list as well. In addition to having that conversation with the coaches to try to get a better sense of what they're looking for and kids they want to recruit academically. So again, very fair question to ask if you're ever in contact with a coach, whether it's over the phone or over email as well. Um, how and where do players typically get seen? I think this is a very good question for players that want to play in front of coaches. What, what I typically recommend for players who are at the beginning of the recruiting process or even kind of in the middle, but they haven't quite narrowed down a list just yet, or they're not getting recruited the way they want to, is to try to go to, to events or camps or, or whatnot where you're going to get seen by a lot of different coaches. This is something that we try to do with the camps we put on at Head First is to try to get our players an opportunity to play in front of a lot of different people from a lot of different levels and hopefully be able to start some relationships based on that. Um, there certainly are many other good, bigger events out there where you will get seen by a lot of different coaches, you know, if you're able to attend some of those as well. Um, and again, certainly happy to chat with anybody one-on-one -on -one about, you know, what are some good options and, and that kind of fit your baseball and academic um, needs as well with that. Kind of on that note, a question that we often get is the, the balance between going to an individual school's 
camp that they put on and doing a bigger showcase. What are the pros and cons to that? And typically the way I look for um, the, the value in a single college camp is that you know this is a place you wanna go, you know you're academically a fit, you've probably already visited and you know it's a social fit, you know enough about the money to know that that's close to a fit, hopefully. And this is really just rubber stamping it with those coaches. Um, so again, oftentimes if, you know, the sometimes the assistant coaches do a lot more of the recruiting than the head coach, depending on the school. And going to a school's camp is a good opportunity to play in front of the recruiting coordinator and the head coach, and probably playing with and against a lot of the other kids that they're recruiting to try to kind of win that spot. And, you know, to be the, you know, the one kid that they choose out of that group. You know, so for example, if, if I was recruiting at a college and we were looking for one catcher in a class, all of our coaches were probably at different events. We probably all saw five to 10 catchers that we liked, try to get them to come to camp. And then from that point, you know, maybe one or two of them wind up getting offered out of that. So that's kind of the way it works on the other end of that. But you wanna make sure that if you're going to a school's camp, it's not the first time they've ever heard of you. And it's not the first time that they've ever seen you. You wanna make sure that you're you're a good fit and at least you know that hey this is a good fit for me um, before you show up there because it, it one um, it's kind of a waste of your time if it's not there's a good chance that you're really not going to get seen and you're not a fit and it wasn't really productive and two you want to know that you're going to want to say yes because a lot of times they're assuming that you're very interested and if they do make you an offer at that point you want to be ready to, to take it at that point so um, but that is kind of usually something I'd recommend doing uh, during the senior year or maybe even sp senior spring. Um, there are some of those that will happen in the winter and late spring. And but make sure you know that it's the place you want to go before you sign up for a lot of those types of, of events. Um, along those same lines, I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the best way to reach out and make contact with college coaches. So I recommend doing a lot of this over email is typically a very good way to start. And, um, and again, we can talk a lot more about how to write a good email, but make sure the, the biggest advice I would give you is make sure that you put the important things up front in the email. You don't necessarily want an introductory paragraph where it's kind of, you're talking about small talk and all that kind of stuff. If you've got some good baseball things and some good academic things that make you a good fit, you wanna make sure that that's in the subject line and you wanna make sure that that's in the first sentence or two. So if you have a 4.0 and you throw 90 miles an hour, you can't put that in the third paragraph, right? That's gotta be right at the very top so that nobody misses it. Um, from, from there, you know, you can go on a little bit deeper into your email and talk a little bit more about your interest in the specific school. So typically we talk about four things that players will wanna have and they'll wanna make sure that you are um, a baseball fit, you wanna make sure that you're an academic fit, you wanna make sure that you're a social fit, and you wanna make sure that you're a financial fit. And a big part of the social fit that even college coaches are looking for is your interest in the school. So if you have one email and you copy paste it, send it to a million coaches, you know, that doesn't necessarily show genuine interest. You might be the type of kid they're looking for, but someone reading that is going to say, I don't know if this kid really actually wants to come here or if he's just kind of throwing a lot of lines in the water and seeing what bites. Um, so you're less likely to get a response. But if you do have a, a line or two or a few sentences about, hey, these are the things that I have re done research on your school or know people there, or you have a specific major or location that I'm interested in, one or two sentences like that can go a long way into starting a conversation uh, that's ultimately gonna benefit you in the process because you show legitimate interest in their school. Um, other ways that players can get seen outside of showcases, and, and kind of this goes along with email a little bit, um, a really good tool is to make a recruiting video. So it's something that, again, we could probably spend a whole video talking about recruiting videos. Uh, George Athen, who many of you know, does a great job making those for a lot of players in our program. So I definitely encourage you to reach out to him uh, if that's something you're interested in doing. But make sure that you show off your best, your best trait. If, you, if you're someone who can throw hard, make sure there's a radar gun in the shot. If you're someone with high exit velo, same thing. Um, if you are fast, make sure that you're running and there's a stopwatch visible in the shot. All right, so again, you're showing off your best tools. Now you wanna make sure too at the same time that you're doing everything a little bit. We wanna make sure that we, we uh, you know, show fielding, show hitting, show pitching, the positions that you play and the things that you would be evaluated on. You wanna make sure that a coach is able to see all those things in your video. Um, 
I'd also recommend that players make one video that has all of their skills in it. You don't necessarily want a hitting one, an infield one, and a pitching one. And I want you just to imagine in your mind that um, there's a, a junior assistant on staff who's kind of in charge of looking at a lot of the videos that come in. He likes your video and forwards it to the recruiting coordinator. He forwards it to the head coach. You don't want something to get lost in there. And so having one video with, with YouTube, with your contact information, with your name, um, all of that in there just makes it really easy for them to get a hold of you if somebody likes what they see and they want to follow up. Um, so again, you can go into that a little bit more, but I'd definitely um, be happy to talk to anybody further about that or also you know, connect you with George if that's something you're interested in as well. The other two things that questions that we often get one um, was about the kind of the value and role of recruiting services. And, you know, I think my opinion on recruiting services is that many of them are, are not necessarily a bad thing. They can be a nice supplement. But at the same time, I also don't know what they do that you can't do yourself in a lot of ways. I think that many of those services wind up being again, a, a resource and, and possibly like a, a third party that kind of can get involved and maybe help you navigate the process, but they're probably not going to have the personal relationships with coaches because they deal with so many people on a macro level. And many of them probably also won't know you as well to be able to really speak to your skills and character and work ethic, the way that coaches that, you know, you interact with on a daily basis, if you, you play for them or you do lessons with them or something else like that. Uh, those people will tend to be better references for you and, and they'll know your skills a little bit better and, and hopefully be able to advise you. So uh, recruiting service is not necessarily a bad thing, but often they can be, you know, probably not the best resource in terms of time and money. Um, along the same lines, what role does high school play in the recruiting process is another very good question. And I think the difficulty with, with high school is that oftentimes high school baseball is played at the same time as college baseball. And so, again, when I was coaching college baseball, we would often have a game on Tuesday, a game on Friday, a game on Saturday, a game on Sunday. We would practice most of the other days. We would travel one of those days. Um, so there's really not a lot of off time, uh, downtime for college coaches in season. So typically, if we were going to watch a high school game, it would be because we already knew about a player. We had already had him on campus. We already knew he was good. And this was just kind of the cross check. This was the... You know, the head coach would go to watch a guy because we wanted to decide if he was a 25% scholarship or a 50% scholarship guy. But we knew he was one of those. You know, you weren't just showing up to a game and hoping to find somebody there. Um, and again, same thing along the lines of a, a larger tournament or camp in the summer. A college coach can go there and see hundreds of players where he's also able to get their contact information and roster sheets and he knows what grade everybody's in and you might have GPAs and all that stuff on the roster that they're given at those big events during the summer and fall. And there's also not games to compete with. So, um, you know, it, it can happen for players that they get seen at a high school game, but it's, it's probably the exception, not the rule. Um, so it's, again, it, it plays a, it plays a part, but it's, it's probably a smaller part than kind of what you're wind up doing in the summer, fall and winter when college coaches aren't in season. Um, the other question, we had a couple other good questions too. Uh, one that I wanna make sure we touch on before we get too deep in the video is a little bit about the financial aid process. And this is something that can kind of vary level to level. And, and I know a lot of people are a little bit uncomfortable talking money and, and that kind of thing, but it is an important variable in the process. Obviously college is, is expensive in many different ways. And I think that's you know certainly a big factor that, that people wanna take into consideration. And it's something I would definitely recommend to all the parents watching the video is, you know, start figuring out, even if your kid is a little bit younger, but kind of start figuring out the plan for, you know, lower the budget for what college is going to look like and, and kind of know what numbers you're working with before you get too deep into the recruiting process. Um, at the same time, there are a number of avenues outside of baseball scholarships that can really help offset the financial cost. Um, so obviously baseball scholarships can be a part of that and, and we hope that it is for many of you. Um, the, the reality is that it is not for most people and it is also not a very large amount of it for most people. Um, like I was saying, the, the most Division I scholarships are less than 50%. Uh, that gets even smaller as you get down the line. Obviously Division I's have 11.7, but they also might have less and they get to divide that amongst 27 players on a 35-man roster. 
a Division II team, for example, is only allowed nine. Very few of them actually have nine full scholarships. So maybe they have three full scholarships and they're dividing it amongst 40 players. So a scholarship may be 500 or $1,000, which again, it's not nothing, but that's really not making a huge dent in um, the, the total cost of attendance. So the, the, big, the other ways that you know, we encourage people to look at the financial part is looking into other merit-based scholarships. So merit meaning um, good grades, right? other outside activities, things like that. So like a merit-based scholarship is an athletic scholarship, a music scholarship, an academic scholarship, something where you're, you're showing merit that is beyond just the normal students there. Um, not everywhere offers merit scholarships. Like for example, the Ivy League does not have any merit scholarship. There's no athletic scholarships, there's nothing. Um, the, the other scholarship form that can be very helpful is um, a financial scholarship. So I would encourage everybody, uh, regardless of income or anything else, to fill out the FAFSA. Uh, the FAFSA is the federal government's way of determining your uh, family's estimated estimated family contribution. So you'll hear the term EFC number thrown around a lot. That's what that means, is the estimated family contribution. So what that is, is a formula that the government puts together that looks at your, your family's income, if you own your home, how many kids, how many kids in college. It takes into f uh, account factors like that and it spits out a number about what the government thinks that you can reasonably afford to pay. So hypothetically, let's say that the total cost of attendance at a college is 50,000 and the estimated family contribution um, is 15,000. So that would leave a gap of $35,000. Now the financial aid office at that school would then try to be, try to give you $35,000 in financial aid. Um, they might not be able to do all that, and that's where loans and that kind of things come in. So they might give you, let's say, 10000 in free money. Um, that's kind of the financial scholarship. That still leaves 25000 of a gap. And then they might offer you some sort of fifteen dollars to $20,000 loan in there as well. There's still probably going to be a gap at the end. Um, so that's a little bit about how FAFSA works um, in terms of calculating financial scholarships in relationship to loans, in relationship to any sort of merit-based scholarship that you can get. So I know it's a lot of information in a short amount of time, but that's just a little bit of a crash course on how that works. But I definitely would recommend everybody fill that out. Um, again, it, it never hurts. It doesn't take very long, especially if you have relatively up-to-date taxes, it can be fairly quick. But that also kind of it leads to, you know, your, your son when he's thinking about playing in college you know, leads to some adult conversations, which are probably a good thing for them to have in terms of student loans and those types of things where, you know, these are decisions that can help them go to a great college. It also, you know, it gives them um, something that they need to be concerned about when they're in their early 20s is kind of graduating and having student debt and, and those types of things. So it's really kind of weighing some of those pros and cons individually as a family. And that can be an important thing. Um, one thing I often talk about and I use this metaphor with, with players too, and, and especially when talking to parents, is that the recruiting process is often like your first job interview. And so even weighing things like, again, you wouldn't accept a job without knowing what the salary was. You wouldn't necessarily commit to a college and agree to go there without knowing what it's gonna cost and all the factors down the road about loans and debt and things like that that kind of are part of it. So it is, I think, a very good tool in really educating um, you know, educating our players in terms of making adult decisions like that. So the, the last question I wanted to talk about a little bit was deciding on community college programs. And I actually got a number of questions about this, but deciding on the programs, um, the pros and cons of JC as a level, and then also um, how do you know which programs are necessarily better for you from a development standpoint. And I definitely think that it's important to take junior college into consideration against other options as well. Uh, you may find yourself in a situation where you have one or two four-year options, and you also might have one or two community college options. So it's kind of all part of the same college option and deciding process that you have. And I think it's important to look at it from the same factors. So what is it, which is the better option, baseball-wise, financially, academically, socially, et cetera. Um, community college will almost always be the better financial option. It's almost never going to be more expensive than a four-year option. Um, 
it can be a very good tool in terms of if you're not really happy with your four-year options, it gets a little bit of a gamble, but going to community college and then hoping that two years later you wind up with a better option because you maybe were able to save money, maybe you were able to improve your grades, maybe you were able to improve your baseball skills or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, I do think it is important realistically to, to look at yourself and say, well, you know, can, can I improve my options if I do go to community college? And we find a lot of players that say, well, I want to play Division I. I'm not getting a Division I scholarship, so I'm going to go to community college. And I think it's an important, again, adult self-reflection type thing to be able to ask, well, will two years actually get you to Division I? Um, so, again, if you're a left-handed pitcher who just had a huge growth spurt, and you've gained 10 miles an hour and you're 17 years old when you graduate high school, maybe. Those types of kids go to community college and again, a year or two of development, that's not unrealistic. Um, for another kid, if you haven't necessarily made those same kind of physical leaps and bounds and you're not physically there and you probably won't be, then again, not that community college is a bad thing, but it's probably not gonna get you to division one. There may be some other pros to it, but I think weighing that against a good four-year option that you do have out of high school is an important one. Um, in terms of deciding between junior colleges, you know, I think you still want to use the same criteria as deciding between four-year options. So thinking about if there are different programs academically or different ability to transfer that wind up being a positive thing, uh, if there's certain things that you value in terms of coach relationship, one program that wins more, one program that you are impressed with their developmental plan or you know just any other thing that you could use as a deciding factor it's important to think about that and I would encourage you to do this with a four-year college as well but if you are on a visit and you're serious and you have some options you know I would definitely look at it as you you want to ask them about their plans so if you talk to the coach and say okay well what is your plan for your players academically you know they should be able to tell you about the study halls and tutoring and the way they use classes and they have a way that they do that um, and, and hopefully, especially if you hear three or four of them, you guys will have a good idea of deciphering who has a better plan than others and hopefully who does a better job for their players academically. Same thing when you're looking at the baseball side of it as well. If I'm a pitcher and I want to throw harder, that's important to me. I should be able to go talk to the team's pitching coach and say, hey, what is your plan for developing velocity and see what they say. Obviously, some coaches are going to be better than others at really articulating their plan and you can see what the kids are doing at practice and and that kind of stuff as well. So um, I think there's definitely some important important questions and to get the ball rolling, especially if you do find yourself, in, and I hope that many of you do, where you have you know several different options that you could go to at the next level. So I know that's a lot of time and we covered a lot of material and, and there's probably a lot of other things we could have gone over in there too, but definitely wanted to thank you all for listening. I hope you guys found this productive. And definitely, I would certainly be happy to meet with anybody individually or in also small groups to talk a little bit further about your specific plans for the recruiting process and, and the goals that you have for the upcoming year, um, as well as just kind of answer any other questions you might have that are a little bit more unique to your situation. So again, hope everybody's uh, staying safe and, and you know in, enjoying your time at home since we're, we're all at home here for the foreseeable future. Um, but definitely hope that we're back out on the baseball field soon and, and we can connect uh, again, this is Jimmy Moyle with Head First Baseball, and good luck. Thank you.